Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. I've always uh, loved talking about musculoskeletal infection. It's really been quite an evolution in our experience at uh, uh, Children's Medical Center. I'm uh, employed by Scottish Rite Hospital and uh, faculty at UT Southwestern, and then, of course, my full-time practice is at Children's. So. Um, today, I'm just going to briefly review our evolution of our program because I think <clears throat> within the history, there's a lot of <clears throat> insight as to how we got here uh, <clears throat> and where we need to go next. And we'll talk a little bit about the role of cognitive biases when I talk about judgment under uncertainty. <clears throat> it's really my current thinking. Uh, I'm beyond the simplistic algorithms and the, the things that give you the answer with just knowing four things about the patient. Uh, because it's much more complex than that. And uh, so I'm trying to distill some principles uh, and just illustrate some of the pattern recognition that leads us to uh, answers that ultimately uh, can improve care of these children. So <clears throat> this is a timeline of our progression, and I'll go into a little bit more detail first as I tell you about our program. But <clears throat> when I got here in 2003, I immediately saw how much infection there was within our community. And um, <clears throat> it was a, an epidemiologic phenomenon that I, I noticed uh, how much infection we had and how complex they were. So we studied that. And when we, when we did, we realized how challenging the care was. So we assembled a multidisciplinary stakeholder team that <clears throat> decided we could do better. So we wrote our own guidelines. Uh, then that was in uh, 2005 to 2007. Did an extensive literature review of over 9,000 abstracts to try and help distill the most relevant evidence that's actually in the literature. And then we put those guidelines into practice for one year uh, just to see the impact of that. And uh, that led to uh, a new program that we developed, which was in anticipation of the Joint Commission Disease Specific Care Certification. So we worked on that for a couple of years. And when we put it in place, we recognized that we really needed to bring the families right into the process that we do. We call it patient and family-centered care. And we've been practicing like that since July 1st of 2012. Along the way, we've been certified three times by the Joint Commission. Uh, we have also have uh, credit that providers uh, receive for caring for the children with us, including all of the subspecialties, first the pediatricians through the ABP MOC program, and then we expanded to the American Board of Medical Subspecialties. <clears throat> we participate in the, on the national level with the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society and the Infectious Disease Society of America in a national bone and joint infection guideline development process. We've been working on these for seven years. It's been very challenging, but they'll probably be published in the next year. And then uh, Cortices is actually a group of pediatric orthopedic PIs at 18 centers, 18 tertiary pediatric medical centers. And so we've started to participate in that, and that's really starting to lead us to the future, which I believe is going to be done through prospective multi-center research. Here's what the Cortices uh, uh, footprint looks like, and it's a very exciting opportunity. That group was initially assembled to study trauma. <clears throat> it, was a, it was a trauma group, and they, uh, the first conversation they had in their meeting was, uh, one of the most interesting things we see when we cover trauma call is infection, because <laughs> the trauma stuff is fairly algorithmic and straightforward. The infection is so complex, and the workflows are so disorganized that we really need to study that first. And so uh, that's what uh, led to that. Uh, so to, just to dive into a little more of the details of what uh, led to our um, interest and the processes that have grown at Children's, um, there was a historic study done at uh, Children's by Mary Ann Jackson and John Nelson that showed the relative incidence of bone and joint infections in that hospital. And when I got there, we studied it again, and we realized there had been a 600% increase in just a 20-year period, which was far uh, more than the population growth in that time window. And so we saw how many infections had occurred, but what we really discovered as we dove into the details is that the care at our institution was literally all over the map. These children were being admitted to 10 different hospital units on six different services to 60 different admitting physicians. 
554 children were hospitalized 591 times, and I call that time period every child for themselves because care was definitely done on a case-by-case -case basis. It was very random. As you read the chart, you just couldn't uh, really believe uh, the antibiotic combinations and the changes. Uh, this is the list of antibiotics that were used just to treat osteomyelitis. There were about 200 cases of osteomyelitis in that three-year period, and there are 33 different antibiotics on this list. And the frequency distributions of the most commonly used ones, that didn't make uh, sense on the merit of the bacteria that we grew in isolation from those cases. There were no cases of clindamycin resistance at that time, and we had enough MRSA to need to cover it empirically. But the drug of choice we should have used at the outset of care in all types of musculoskeletal infection, but particularly for osteomyelitis, should have been clindamycin, but we were only using it empirically 12.9% of the time. That meant by the time we finally figured it out, which might be three or four days into the hospitalization, we were probably on the wrong drug altogether. And vancomycin <clears throat> is not a good drug to use for osteomyelitis because it's too large of a molecule to get into bone, and it doesn't kill intracellular organisms. So it's, uh, but we were using it like it was uh, highly effective. So <clears throat> when you deal with a large organization, it's kind of like being in a grain silo. Every, every service has its own workflows, its own processes of care, and you just pass these children from one silo to the next, and then it's as if we're starting over again. So uh, that recognition uh, allowed us to see we were taking two and a half days on average to get an MRI scan of these kids after admission. And uh, the MRI was often necessary to really know what we were treating and then to proceed with the correct uh, next step, which often included surgery. We kept kids in the hospital for almost 13 days with osteomyelitis. And once they left, 11% of them came back in for another admission. And to say that the families were dissatisfied is really an understatement. And so it was one of the hospitalists that approached me and said, we're really kind of frustrated with what's going on with these kids uh, because there's so many uh, confusing things for these families. They're, they're hearing so many different versions of what's going on and the NPO violations and the delay to get scans and the delay to get surgery. So we knew we had to make a difference and we assembled a multidisciplinary uh, group with emergency room, orthopedics, infectious disease, ICU, radiology, lab, nursing staff, pharmacy, quality, social work and the, and the pediatric hospitalists, and that led to a, uh, a change. We wrote our own guidelines because on, uh, when we immersed ourselves in the literature and we did that 9,000 uh, article uh, review, we realized there wasn't a lot of high quality uh, literature out there. In fact, it boiled down to less than 300 studies that were relevant to grade our guidelines and help us to realize we are actually applying these correctly. Um, but we, it was experience that really drove the guideline uh, development. We knew that much of this wasn't rocket science. It was basically just common sense. We knew that 33 antibiotics and vancomycin were not the right choice. And so uh, we also improved the process of where these children went within the hospital. So when we implemented the guidelines in 2009, they only went to two hospital units, to two admitting service services, and we had daily team huddles, but it just involved the providers, the nurse, the physicians, and the research team, uh, and the, the social worker. And uh, by putting those into place, we made a, a quick change. It was low-hanging fruit. We cut the MRI scan delay to less than a day. We improved the appropriate use of empiric antibiotics uh, to 85.2% and uh, improved the uh, acquisition of blood cultures before giving antibiotics, and cut the length of stay by about three days, cut the readmission rate in half. <clears throat> so fast forward to where we are now, we recognize one of the key components we were missing in this whole process was the family being right in the conference room with us. So now uh, we have only one hospital unit that we admit the children to. It's one admitting service. We have daily family-centered care rounds. We bring the patient, the family, whenever possible. Uh, the nurse, the charge nurse, the care coordinator, the physical therapist, orthopedics, uh, pediatrics, all together in one room. Nothing makes more of an impression on how important these families are to us than us sitting around the table all focused on them. We have the uh, chart open. We show them everything, the labs, the uh, culture results, the MRI findings. Uh, 
And this is our basic workflow. <clears throat> it's what allows us to accelerate the correct uh, decision making about whether we should get an MRI or not. Once we decide we're going to get one on that same day, we're uh, present at the time when the scan is done so I can guide the anesthesia team as well as the MRI tech to get the correct image sequences. And then we're making a decision whether the child needs surgery or not. We've posted them to the operating room just in case and then we take them under continued anesthesia right to the operating room and do the procedure that we uh, believe is indicated on the merit of the clinical presentation. Traditional MRIs are obtained, uh, usually done with and without contrast with multiple sequences. I know because we used to do it this way. We thought that contrast was necessary so we could see these obvious abscesses and that would guide us to the surgical decision making. This scan was done at our center and it took uh, two hours and it was 10 sequences done with and without contrast. Well, there's some controversy about the continued use of contrast at the rate in which we were using it. We used it in nearly 100% of scans leading up to uh, 2012. And uh, so we decided we would uh, implement a better way of doing things by uh, the process I just outlined to you. And in a six year period, we evaluated over 1,800 children who were suspected to have musculoskeletal infection, but we only obtained scans in about 28% of those. And as the study progressed in two-year increments from an initial, middle, to final period, we cut the rate of obtaining MRIs because we decided we could learn a lot more about the patient by just good old-fashioned history, physical examination, basic review of radiology studies prior to MRI, and, and lab values. Uh, we <clears throat> increased the percentage of scans that in retrospective review, we said this scan was actually indicated because we were getting about 20% of scans that weren't indicated. And in the last time period, we were cutting that to about 7%. And we reduced the amount of sedation being used. As we got more efficient, we shortened the scan duration so we needed to sedate fewer children. There is a rate of negative MRIs. We certainly see kids that come in looking like, I believe this is probably a musculoskeletal infection. They have focal physical findings. They have impressive laboratory elevation. They have fever. And so almost all of these negative scans were indicated studies. Uh, we really believe that that was the right way of evaluating it. So this is where the real magic happened. We reduced the number of body areas being scanned, the number of sequences per scan, the scan duration, the anesthesia duration, and ultimately the percentage of contrast being used. <clears throat> but beyond that, it forced us to change our guideline. We were ordering these scans with and without contrast just habitually. It was in our guideline. And so in the last six months of the study, we changed our guideline and we notified all of our stakeholders <clears throat> that we would no longer order these scans with, with and without contrast. And in doing so, we um, ended up only scan, uh, using contrast in 8.5% of those patients. And those scans took 24 minutes or, or around there on average and only about four sequences. So <clears throat> I believe that these are really the only indications for MRI in a child who's suspected to have musculoskeletal infection. Whenever we have a clinical suspicion of a bone or muscle infection, whether it's isolated or with contiguous infections like septic arthritis or abscess, then it's appropriate to get an MRI. And it allows us to establish the anatomic and spatial orientation of the infection and, and assess for things that might indicate surgery. And then whenever there's an uncertain clinical picture in which musculoskeletal infection is definitely in the differential diagnosis, when you see elevated inflammatory markers, fever, focal physical findings, and you're considering whether other things might be possible, then that's a good choice to, to get a scan. So the ideal MRI protocol that we follow now, <clears throat> we order them without contrast, and we just get three key sequences. It's always done bilateral if it's the pelvis or lower extremities. Upper extremities we still do unilaterally. We, do, we start with an extended field of view uh, coronal stir. Takes about five minutes. Looks like this. This is a four-year-old female with proximal leg tenderness. I thought on exam maybe it was the proximal tibia and thinking in advance that it was probably osteomyelitis. She had elevated inflammatory markers and fever. Uh, and, and as it turned out on this extended field of view coronal st uh, stir, it was the proximal fibula that was affected. And then we follow that up with the same extended field of view T1, allows us to see the bone marrow well, and you can see the modeling of the proximal fibular uh, uh, metaphysis. 
And then we only get this, the uh, axial stir over the area of interest. And where we were really interested was whether there was an abscess that might need surgery up here. And so you can see the periosteum distended and the fluid underneath there. And because of the clinical history and the presentation, there's not really a question as to what that fluid is. So I don't need to give contrast to see it look different because I know very obviously what it will be. And so this scan took 13 minutes. And we took that child immediately to the operating room after the scan and did that procedure. So <clears throat> since we implemented patient and family-centered care and had a better understanding of the disease process and improved processes of care, we radically reduced the length of stay to as low as 4.3 days, cut the readmission rate and kept it low, continued to get MRIs when we want to get them using the process that we put in place and improve the, not only the selection of appropriate empiric antibiotic, but the timing in which it's administered. So families like this program. <clears throat> uh, in 2013, we started administering the NRC Picker Satisfaction Survey. And in the past few years, we have continued to improve the percentage of families who overall think that the hospital care was exceptional. And uh, that's a marked difference than where we started. So along the way, we've learned a lot of lessons. And of these things, we're not uncertain. It's very clear to us that improving provider to provider communication, having coordinated interdisciplinary care, bringing the families into the center of what we do, uh, defining the disease process better so that we can recognize the patterns of infection and not need to get advanced studies when the problem is right there in front of us. Overall, we work to keep the child safe, to heal them, to be nice to them, uh, and along the way, we've recognized that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with these conditions and avoiding the cognitive biases, which is the, really the impetus for this talk, is uh, really critical. And so it's become uh, more clear to me that that is the next uh, generation. That's the higher hanging fruit of what we need to do to study these conditions and the related conditions that come in looking like them. So exceptional care is executed through deliberate workflows and processes which are done systematically through a team approach. Experience has allowed us to distill some principles which I'm gonna share with you, which I believe are the foundations for best practice. And then uh, our thorough literature review that we've done, not only with our own guideline development, but now on the national scale, when we've looked through all of this literature, we realize that there are some profound gaps in knowledge and the next generation of research really needs to be done uh, in a very different manner. So judgment under uncertainty, this is the next horizon in musculoskeletal infection discovery. This is definitely chess, not checkers, and we have to embrace this uncertainty. If we, over, if we accept models that oversimplify the question and allow us to get to answers before we really should be deriving them, then we'll be lost. Uh, and as, we, as I see quite commonly in my, in my active practice, so the probabilistic thinking, that's necessary. Deterministic thinking is an example of using things like uh, the Coker criteria and applying it uh, at large to almost every child who comes in with an isolated hip effusion that looks like it might be septic arthritis or not. And so the, those criteria are intended to give a helpful uh, guidance, but they're often used as making a decision and we shouldn't use them that way. So this is really the highest hanging fruit. Uh, we, I think, have exposed all of the low hanging fruit in our processes. And we'd like this to be easier than it is, uh, but embracing the fact that it's, it's just not going to be easy. And understanding that and understanding the uncertainty involved really will make a difference. So the case for uncertainty, <clears throat> I see a lot of diverse pathology that comes in looking like infection, but it's not. And yet the initial impression of everyone is that this could be, and that's not a bad starting point, <clears throat> but recognizing that it certainly may not be and, and pursuing the final answer until we re reach it, I think that's an appro appropriate approach. There's a wide spectrum of disease or illness severity for children who we know have certain conditions. <clears throat> for example, osteomyelitis ranges from life-threatening in the ICU, on pressors, um, and requiring multiple surgeries to a simple bone infection that requires no intervention can be hospitalized for just a couple of days. So with that wide spectrum of disease, there comes a lot of uncertainty in the best approach to manage the spectrum. And then the deterministic approach, which it's based on clinical prediction rules or algorithms, and that leads to inaccuracy and delayed diagnosis. I'll show you some examples. 
a lack of a unified theory of disease, and this is where the literature needs to really be careful, and uh, a data dictionary. So I see a lot of studies about septic arthritis that <laughs> include cases very obviously that are children with osteomyelitis and contiguous septic arthritis, and it's very misleading because they are not the same condition. Uh, septic arthritis has a lot of things that differentiate it if it's an isolated condition uh, from those children who have bone infections with adjacent joint infections. So <clears throat> the accumulation of experience is lacking at most centers. I know it was at ours when we had all of those different uh, participants of care and the 10 different hospital units and the six different services and all the different admitting physicians. And what you get then is a lot of people that have a little bit of exposure to things and they never see those profound lessons that become very obvious to us over time. And so rotating coverage of services and limited desire of ownership of these cases that are just a little bit too complex, and we'd rather have something simpler. <clears throat> Here's an example of a two-year-old girl that woke up from a nap. She had left hip pain. She didn't want to walk. She had a normal C-reactive protein, a normal sedimentation rate. The white blood cell count got some people's attention, and, but she was afebrile. She had a hip effusion, which was clearly seen on the ultrasound. Um, and so uh, when we talked about it in the morning, uh, one of my partners and the fellow on service said, what are you going to do for this child? And I said, well, I'm going to go examine her first because I was just hearing the story. And I said, but if I'm concerned, if I develop a sense of worry about her, I'm going to aspirate this hip. And they said, why would you aspirate transient synovitis? Because this is transient synovitis, right? It only has one of the Coker criteria which is the elevated white blood cell count. And I said, well, <clears throat> I said, I don't, I don't use the COCA criteria in that way. I said, first of all, I'm worried because of the age group. So transient synovitis is a three to nine year uh, phenomenon. And I see uh, some innocuous cases of septic arthritis in this age group that are due to a bacteria that is relatively indolent in presentation, and that is Kingella kingae. So I said, I've seen cases of Kingella kingae with normal labs or minimally elevated labs that, that just start to rise through the course of care. So I did examine the child and, and I was worried about her, not only because of the age group, but just because of the way she did not like me moving her hip. And so I proceeded, aspirated the hip, and uh, thanks to Dr. Ellis, who uh, enlightened me about hip arthroscopies, I have a tool now, which is the uh, arthroscopy treatment of septic arthritis of the hip. And it allows for minimally invasive approaches in cases of uncertainty. So I'm, I'm not creating as much of an impact on the child in their early recovery. So I aspirated the hip. The fellow was standing next to me uh, with eager anticipation of expecting a clear appearing joint fluid. And it came out looking like pus. And then he hung his head because he was like, my whole worldview is now shattered. And I said, that is what I'm here to do. Uh, <clears throat> because a cell count of 60,000 with 85% segmented neutrophils, and that's what ultimately came back, is possibly, and it, may, it might even say probably, septic arthritis. And so <clears throat> we proceeded with the arthroscopy uh, to wash out the hip, saw the inflammation of the joint capsule, and <clears throat> And so uh, I send these studies for uh, uh, aerobic culture, as well as a 16S PCR and the cell count, of course. And it's all just to continue to gather evidence. Am I sure this child had septic arthritis? Not positive, not in a definitive way. Uh, but uh, it was certainly the right treatment course to follow. It would have been a mistake to leave that cell count in that joint. Um, so we proceeded onward. And uh, a couple of weeks later, her inflammatory markers were now a little bit elevated, which is different from what I expect to see with the treatment of septic arthritis. So I always think about having a wider net and consider other conditions. <clears throat> and so then she started to materialize some other joints that started bothering her, her jaw, her other elbow, and uh, the knee on the affected side. And so we started asking the question, could this be an inflammatory arthritis? I've also occasionally seen post-treptococcal reactive arthritis present like this. And so, as it turned out, she was ultimately diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis and seen by the rheumatologist. Now, if you know uh, some uh, pediatric rheumatologists, if you ever say, hey, I have this uh, cute little kiddo, and they have a single hip joint uh, inflamed, uh, would you like to see them? 
uh, you might hear the word never <laughs> uh, come up. Because I, I know one a very experienced rheumatologist who would say this is never the initial presentation of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. But I've seen four cases in which it was. So it just shows some of the uncertainty that we deal with and how the better systematic approach, which is what we followed with that child, can lead us to a better place. So in the past seven years, we've done over 2,800 evaluations for children with confirmed deep infections some abscesses that we continue to drain in the operating room, but we, we have far fewer. But the interesting part of this slide is the, all the other things. In 1,778 cases, that's two-thirds of what I see in my practice are suspected to have musculoskeletal infection, but play out to be other things. This is an eye chart, I realize, but it just demonstrates the magnitude of what those other things might be. And if you have the mindset of it's either going to be transient synovitis or septic arthritis, you will be misled. <laughs> and so other types of bacterial infections that aren't of the musculoskeletal uh, system, viral processes, neoplastic and hematologic disorders, inflammatory and immunologic processes, congenital, developmental, and acquired orthopedic conditions, fractures or injury can occasionally present looking like infection, and then otherwise uh, not specified symptoms, which are usually viral processes. They run a self-limited course and go away. I recently had a 10-month-old boy who had been seen in the emergency room, had a knee effusion that was pretty impressive, and minimally elevated labs. And he was diagnosed with transient synovitis of the knee and sent to see me in my clinic. And the, for some reason, there was a delay. It took about three weeks for him to come in and finally see me. At that point, he still had a very large knee effusion and a very tense knee effusion, and I, he didn't want me to move his knee at all. But his CRP was still less than 0 0.29. His SED rate had only gone from about 10 to 13 in that entire time. And in my mind, <clears throat> because of this process and the systematic approach, I simply asked the family one question. And I can't tell you uh, the intuition that led me to that question. Uh, and they were a Spanish-speaking family, and I said, does he uh, bleed or bruise easily. And uh, they were shocked with the interpreter and said, no, why would you have thought to ask that question? And they said, yes, he does. And he, it was his first uh, diagnosis of hemophilia. And so uh, the systematic approach leads us only so far. Ultimately, we do have to use intuition. Um, of those other conditions, 230 of these required more urgent evaluation by subspecialties. You can see some interesting uh, diagnoses on there, leukemia, Ewing sarcoma, rheumatic fever, uh, and other uh, neoplastic processes. Uh, and so I think that this uh, systematic approach that we have is leading to get to these answers much more early than if we allow these patients to just play out through the system. If I took the approach of it's not us, it's not musculoskeletal infection, then there would be a lot of uh, lost children out there waiting for their diagnosis. So this is my wheelhouse where I reside, but there's a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlapping conditions that uh, it's interesting because I think we'd largely get these into the correct buckets, uh, but there is that area of uncertainty. So I, I call it the Olympics of uh, highly complex uh, condition evaluation. This to me is the foundation. If there were principles that I could share with you today and say uh, it, it actually doesn't look very elaborate, but, but if I do this, uh, then I get there uh, much more early than if I used other approaches. History and physical examination, I know it sounds simple, but doing it myself and not reading the interpretations of others or their, their evaluations and findings, uh, that helps. And think in terms of probabilities, as well as in the epidemiology of disease. And I'll show you what those uh, foundational epidemiology uh, data are in a second. Uh, CBC, CRP, SED rate, with a differential on the CBC and a blood culture anytime there's a deep infection concern. For, X, for radiology, it's just plain x-ray of the symptomatic region. And, and focusing on that area where the symptoms occurred. I see often laundry list of x-rays that get obtained from the pelvis down to the ankles and foot when, a, when the history has always been very focused. It was the knee, the knee, the knee. And maybe in some situations you do need to evaluate the hip with knee symptoms, but for the most part, we, we have a scattershot approach to evaluating these cases. And then this is where the intuition comes in, the pattern recognition.
and a decision for admission. Am I really worried about this child? They look like they're tanking, it's sepsis. They go to the ICU. They get a, a broad spectrum antibiotics and resuscitation. If I'm generally worried, I believe that inpatient evaluations in this multidisciplinary approach are the, are the best way. So they should be admitted and then continue to go through this evaluation in a systematic way within any institution and certainly ours. And then if I'm not worried, I like to externalize those children from the hospital setting. I think we've avoided so many aspirations of transient synovitis in our practice because I've externalized those patients at the point of care. When I hear about them in the emergency room and I'm, I'm hearing everything that makes sense that this is probably transient synovitis, I like to have a quick second look in my outpatient clinic just to make sure that it's evolving along that path or that it's not been mislabeled like a 10-month-old with a knee or, or something like that. So that's very helpful. And then we can recover from that, even if it were something more evolving, like a Kingella septic arthritis. And the decision for advanced imaging, well, that follows after all of that. And then we follow our process that I outlined. So I'm gonna briefly go through some of the epidemiology things that I have in my mind about these disease processes, because I think that if you understand these foundational elements, you're at a much better place to making those, those decisions. Bone infections come through the bloodstream. They're fairly unique to children and adolescents, and they involve the metaphyseal ends of long bones. There are a few equivalent sites, like the inferior pubic ramus of the pelvis, the posterior tuberosity of the calcaneus, the vertebral end plates of the spine uh, that can be, behave like long bones. These are otherwise healthy children. They don't have an underlying immunologic compromise, and it's a minor trauma to the affected area that I can elicit out of the history in about 75% of those cases. And that's probably relevant to how the bacteria flow to that area immediately after the trauma, if there's a transient bacteremia, and then exit the bloodstream and go into that area. Currently in our practice, we're seeing about 60 to 70 cases a year. And so by physical examination and the basic review of the data, elevated inflammatory markers, fever, metaphyseal bone tenderness, they don't like it at all. And if you push further away from that area along the diaphysis, they don't like that either because of the pressure within the bone. So if I see erythema overlying that area and somebody's calling it cellulitis, and I push on the other side of the bone away from the erythema or more proximally on the diaphysis, and I sense that, yeah, this is possibly a bone infection bone infection. And the reasonable joint range of motion, they'll tolerate that pretty well. It's tender around that area, but they'll let you move the joint. And it's a staph aureus disease. 91% uh, of culture positive cases are staph aureus, and 39% of our cases are MRSA. <clears throat> Bacteremia is present in 45% of the cases on the initial blood culture in our community. And the subsequent blood cultures are positive in 64% of those cases. So if you see bacteremia, you were thinking maybe this was cellulitis or some superficial infection. When I see bacteremia, it changes my way of thinking. I become more worried. And <clears throat> uh, it, this is a pattern recognition. When I see MRSA, septic pulmonary air, uh, or patchy infiltrates on the chest X-ray, markedly elevated inflammatory markers, and they go to the ICU, um, I'm thinking about a DVT. We treat these with antibiotics first by vein, then by mouth, three plus weeks. Uh, in the more severe cases, we're treating them for three and a half months uh, until their sed rate normalizes. And uh, the long-term outcomes from bone infections, overall is pretty good. 92% are doing great. We followed them for two and a half years, uh, but we see about 8% of growth arrest, deformity, limb length inequality, osteonecrosis, and an interesting phenomenon of central physeal tenting uh, right next to the physis. This is what it looks like, these tiny little blips right in the center of the physis. But these kids have normal Harris growth arrest lines growing symmetrically away. They have no limb length inequality, and that's two and a half years after the fact, and we don't believe that that's a problem. Here are the severe sequelae of osteomyelitis, and there's not much that we really feel like we can do differently. Uh, these outcomes are largely driven by the severity of illness. We have a scoring system, and all of these kids had uh, eight to 10 scores on a scale of uh, zero to 10. And so this particular child at age 12 developed this severe infection, had five surgeries, and ultimately six months after onset, uh, about four and a half months after leaving the hospital, had this pathologic fracture of the femoral neck and led to uh, this joint replacement surgery. So among our ICU admissions, just to show what we're largely dealing with, 59% of those have DVTs. They almost all have initial bacteremia with an average duration of bacteremia of 5.1 days. 
and the record holder is 16 consecutive days of bacteremia. Um, our bone culture isolation rate is 100% in those cases, and now the, the pathogen flips. It becomes more predominantly MRSA with 71%. High severity of illness scores, almost all these children require surgery and multiple surgeries per child. They stay in the hospital for about three weeks. We treat them with antibiotics for about three and a half months. High rate of readmission, but most of those don't have to do with the residual or recurrent infection. And we get a lot of pathologic fractures based on the surgery. Septic arthritis is a joint space infection, comes through the bloodstream in otherwise healthy children. They have some minor trauma to the area, but not nearly as commonly, and these are usually younger children. We see about 40 a year, and it's joint irritability on exam. When I try and move that joint and they don't like it at all, they're somewhat locked down, fairly rigid, uh, and I know there's an effusion there, either from physical exam or imaging. Uh, that's what gets my, uh, my attention. The spectrum of clinical isolates is very different from osteomyelitis. We have a laundry list of organisms that we'll identify. Sure, there's some staph aureus, but it's only 24% of culture positive cases. And in our community, 16% are MRSA. So we do believe that clindamycin is still the empiric drug of choice. Uh, but in the neonates, we get group B strep and the Enterobacteria CA. In the age group from six months to four years of age, this is where we see the Kingella and strep pneumo and H. flu type B and Neisseria meningitidis. <clears throat> and so Kingella peaks at around two years of age. So that's why when I see a two-year-old child, I immediately start thinking along that line of possibility. Uh, strep pyogeny starts to hit the school-age children and then GC and the sexually active teens. Uh, bacteremia rate is lower, only 13%. And I think within these, the subsequent positive blood cultures that are positive, there's hidden osteomyelitis. If we had looked further, if we'd gotten an MRI in those cases, we probably would have found the contiguous osteomyelitis because I don't believe that septic arthritis has as high of a bacteremia rate um, for a reason. It's a different disease process. Culture positivity, it's hard to grow bacteria from joint fluid. We only grow it 35% of the time and the PCRs are positive in only in about half the cases. So we deal with much greater uncertainty when we manage a child with septic arthritis, given all the other things that it could be. Um, and so we have to have that broad net and we have to have that systematic approach. We open the joint or scope it, wash it out, <clears throat> antibiotics first by vein, then by mouth. It's the current guidelines are gonna suggest 10 to 14 days may be sufficient to treat septic arthritis, whereas three to four weeks are necessary for osteomyelitis. And that's gonna create a decision point where we're gonna to have to get more MRI scans on kids with septic arthritis <clears throat> to make sure we're treating them long enough <clears throat> in case they had a bone infection. Here's a 17-month-old female with minimally ele elevated inflammatory markers, had the high white count, uh, obvious effusion on hip ultrasound, uh, 90,000 uh, cell count with 87% SEGS, and this was another case of Kingella in that age group. Uh, scoped the hip, placed the drain, washed it out. 14-month-old female, this also was Kingella, and I was called uh, and told I have a case of uh, transient synovitis of the ankle in a 14-month-old, and, and they showed me the x-rays, and I could see the effusion, and we aspirated it then in the, in the ER. The CRP was 0.9. I said, well, what about the SED rate? Was that concerning? And they said, oh, we just thought that was a spurious number. It didn't make sense. Uh, so with Kingella, we will see a separation. The SED rate continues to rise. They can have an indolent initial presentation. CRP can hover in a lower count. And so when I see that type of mismatch, it makes me think about Kingella. Transient synovitis, otherwise healthy kids, and it's an upper respiratory illness in most of those cases. I see about 100 a year. And this is the age group, three to nine. I'm worried if they're not three to nine. <clears throat> uh, and this is the joint, the hip. I think differently if it's not. Uh, I, I won't say that it, it can never be. I've seen things that behave like transient synovitis of other joints, but uh, it raises my level of worry. Uh, almost sim similar physical findings as septic arthritis. It's just a little bit milder, and the bacteremia rate, it should be zero. If, it's a, if it grows something, is it a contaminant? Uh, and if not, well, of course, then it's real, and then it's, uh, it's, it's septic arthritis in evolution. Um, <clears throat> I recommend using ibuprofen as a therapeutic tool, not as a diagnostic tool. I've had children that were running around the preoperative stretcher uh, in the holding area when I was about to aspirate their hip to, uh, and potentially operate on them, and the family was looking at me like, what are we actually doing here? 
and um, uh, they'd received ibuprofen all night long, and that uh, makes early septic arthritis feel great. So <clears throat> anti-inflammatories, activity limitation, one to two weeks, and I tell them that the true timeline is about four to six weeks for it to fully run its course and finally go away. That avoids a lot of concern. But if they're going on beyond that, I've seen cases of Perthes, JIA, post-streptococcal reactive arthritis, because I follow them long enough if those families come back and they have a, another concern. So here's the COCR criteria. We all probably know them by heart. It's uh, fever, inability to bear weight, white count greater than 12, sed rate greater than 40. Uh, and then that created this incredible predictive probability scheme, which is intended to be, unfortunately, a, a shortcut, a mental shortcut, a deterministic device. Is it septic arthritis or transient synovitis? And now I have my answer with four simple things. And the subsequent studies to validate those seem to suggest that. And then we had the CRP added, which gave this odds ratio to say if it, a CRP is greater than two, the problem is that this doesn't work in clinical practice, and not with all of the things that I see or do. So this is a deterministic approach. I use the parameters. I, I use those basic things, but I don't use those cutoffs. I, I keep a very open mind about the septic arthritis transient synovitis question. Pyomyositis, it's a muscle infection, otherwise healthy kids, preceded by minor trauma in a high percentage of those cases. We only get about 15 cases of primary pyomyositis a year. It's the muscle tenderness. It's usually fairly, you know, they're pointing to the middle component of their leg. They're pointing right to the muscle. When you relax the muscle length, they, their symptoms are better. When you stretch the muscle, then they don't like it. And the joint movement on either end is fine. They don't have metaphyseal bone tenderness. And it's a staph aureus disease, a lot of MRSA, group A beta hemolytic strep and, and the remainder. Uh, it's uh, low bacteremia rate, low subsequent positive blood culture rate, muscle tenderness, as I mentioned before. Culture positive, it's easy to grow bacteria from pus, and uh, we treat them with antibiotics. It's about three weeks, and they resolve. Here's a case of biceps pyomyositis with an abscess back in the era when we used to give contrast, elevated inflammatory markers, we drain it. And then finally, the complex skin and skin structure infections. These do come through superficial local entry, abrasions, insect bites, scratches, people trying to drain some kind of pustule with needles inserted into the subcutaneous area, thousands of them out there. And so it's visible skin defects or drainage coming to a head, geographic erythema, local swelling, inflammation, limited use, markedly elevated inflammatory markers, but beware of the hidden cases of deep infections. Usually that erythema is more oval and very, very much more focal. It doesn't have that serpiginous uh, and geographic extent. And, uh, so, and then the bacteremia. Um, so it's staph aureus for abscesses. It's strep for cellulitis, fasciitis, lymphangitis, and lymphadenitis. I say nearly 0% because I've had a case of, of uh, lymphadenitis with a very large blown up lymph node and a case of uh, staph aureus with bacteremia that on MRI had no deep infection. And I've had three cases of uh, group A beta hemolytic strep bacteremia in kids. At the end of the day, they had all superficial level of infection, just an impressive amount that fed the bacteria into the bloodstream. So <clears throat> it's, it's, but all of those kids got MRIs because we felt obligated to look for the deep infection. It's easy to grow bacteria from pus. We, we push on these at bedside most commonly now, EMLA, a little bit of heat applied to the area, bedside decompression, and get the cultures. Because of the Staph aureus MRSA, we're now seeing more clindamycin resistance of these superficial type of infections in our community. Necrotizing fasciitis is not common in children and adolescents. I've been in practice for 23 years. I've never seen a case in a child or adolescent. I'm sure that it may come one day. So I'm not saying it won't happen, but um, I'm not uh, expecting it anytime soon, just based on that track record. I've seen it in adults several times. It's a patient in extremis fighting for their life, going to the operating room urgently, being, having all their tissues dissected away, usually by general surgeons, and we're, we're there to say, yeah, it's probably gonna end in an amputation. Um, and so antibiotics first by vein, then by mouth, 10 to 14 days. Often some of these can be interrupted even with just a straight oral course, and they do great. 13-year-old that had a pustule on the back of her leg, it was ruptured with a needle sent for culture, and then they got a lot worse. These are MRIs that I don't think we should get, but this one was obtained. We had the history and physical, and then it was right there in front of us. It was still draining pus coming out of that uh, one point of entry. Um, so 
A lot of my thinking currently is guided by uh, these fine individuals, Danny Kahneman, Amos Tversky. It's really been in the past couple of years with all of this accumulation of data and experience that I'm, I'm focusing on judgment under uncertainty. A great book uh, by Michael Lewis who wrote Moneyball, The Undoing Project, is about their relationship and, and the evolution of thought that led to their uh, Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, treatise in, the, in economics. Uh, about the heuristics and biases that guide us, and Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It really is all about having a systematic approach and being very deliberate and following very specific processes. And I think it does get us to answers, but we're not doing it in a deterministic way. We're doing it in a probabilistic way. This is Scott Hattieberg, who played catcher for the Boston Red Sox and lost his professional career due to, due to an ulnar nerve palsy that failed ulnar nerve transposition surgery. But uh, Billy Bean and some uh, quirky guy from Massachusetts who followed Kahneman's uh, uh, thinking uh, developed a team, uh, and that was uh, Hattieberg's uh, walk-off home run against the Kansas City Royals for 20 consecutive games, which is the Moneyball story. So man is a deterministic device. <clears throat> We're thrown into this probabilistic universe, and we're faced with problems that probably have a statistically correct answer. Most humans don't think like that. And snap judgment and cognitive biases, I see this played out over and over again. Healthcare providers tend to focus what they're asked to pay attention to. I've seen kids get uh, referred to our fracture clinic with uh, you know, marked swelling and erythema, and everyone is telling them, well, you're just not elevating it enough. You need to elevate it more. And then been sent out and gone to other hospitals where a large abscess was drained and osteomyelitis was discovered. So it, it was that, uh, you know, the blinders on, you're here for a fracture evaluation, you're going to get one, and, and we're going to treat you like a fracture until proven otherwise. And so this is a metaphor for the cognitive biases. Uh, just looking at this, you think the distance between the horizontal lines on the left and the, and the vertical lines on the right is probably dissimilar. Uh, one would have to be longer than the other. And so, but when you take those lines and superimpose them, you realize they're actually identical. But even after I remove those lines, you look at it and you still say, no, they're, they're different. And that's what happens with this uh, process of the cognitive biases. So the important ones that I see played over and over again in healthcare, anchoring, failing to account for new information or data after the initial impression has been made. Uh, representativeness is this similarity between whatever we ha are judging and some convenient mental model. The convenient mental model of transient synovitis is out there at large, and we misapply it in so many situations. The same thing with, uh, with necrotizing fasciitis, being asked about it 150 times in the last uh, you know, roughly 12 years or so. Uh, and never seeing a case. I know that people have that in their mind. They're thinking that it could be that. Uh, and human judgment is distorted by the most recent and memorable. If you hear hoofbeats, think horses and not zebras. I know these are common sense things, but the reality is they're out there. For the world of musculoskeletal infection, <clears throat> there, this is prevalent. And so our new way of thinking needs to be guided by a, uh, a judgment under uncertainty with a systematic approach. So keep an open mind, use a broad net, be inclusive of all realistic probabilities on the basis of epidemiology, the things, the basic framework that I showed you. Never say never or always when including an, or excluding conditions during the workup. Follow the systematic approach of information gathering, those basic foundational things that I shared with you today, and then avoid, uh, th that will help you to review and avoid diagnostic delay or inaccuracy. And think in a generalized manner of relative probabilities based on this local epidemiology of disease and pattern recognition, and avoid deterministic methods, simple algorithms that uh, give us the answer before we really should have it. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Lawson. Uh, be before we get to, if anyone has any questions here, there was. Um, a question that was emailed that um, I wanted to start with. There, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but I, I think there is a commonly, uh, before a child gets to the hospital, and there is a suspicion of a musculoskeletal infection, whether transient synovitis or septic arthropathy, and particularly the hips. We see, tend to see that more often, and we can't see it clinically quite as well. Um, could you just let us, I mean, at what time point, uh, could you just give us your thoughts based on your experience and the research that you've done, kind of from a pediatrician or, or a first provider standpoint, uh, 
what, what kind of brief algorithm would you recommend going through and, and, you had, and, and really leaning on imaging because you had suggested uh, in your preliminary um, evaluation to really clinical exam is important, but then x-rays are oftentimes, maybe sometimes we lean more towards an ultrasound first if we're suspecting hip pathology, but thought maybe you could comment on that preliminary algorithm. <clears throat> yes, I, you know, again, I think clarifying by listening carefully to the family and also the basic exam of which specific body area is the level of focus, and then the plane radiographs and uh, assessing for, you know, effusions or any cortical or metaphyseal, you know, uh, involvement that might suggest there's a, a, you know, bone inflammation or neoplasm, something like that. I mean, it's the... Uh, at least to get that much information and those basic labs. I think the basic labs, I see, I see a lot of elaborate labs that you know, people will get, like ANA and rheumatoid factor, and uh, the, the starting with this, you know, the strep antibodies. I think all those things happen downstream. I think just the very basic C-reactive protein, SED rate, CBC with diff, um, and if, it, if you're concerned about a possible uh, deep infection, always get a blood culture with those initial labs. And that, those things are just very standardized in my mind. And then um, after you've done that basic evaluation, I think that's when intuition you know, can kick in a little bit. Am I worried about this? You know, I think that uh, one study I read in the past was done in England, and, and they were trying to use some tools that would help differentiate septic arthritis from transient synovitis. And, and the thing that they found most uh, valuable was the uh, concern of an experienced provider. <laughs> that, that was it. And so that, that, that's intuition and also experience on top of it. And, and I, so I, I do think intuition plays a role. That's, fast, that's uh, system one thinking. And, and I use it with every case. So if you're worried, then I think that's the child that needs to get escalated to the next level of care. If you're not worried, but, but there's still a little bit of uncertainty in there, I don't know exactly what this child has, but there's something in evolution, that's a perfect outpatient you know, referral, you know, second look, having, uh, having us take a, a glance at them in that setting. Does anyone have any questions here? Because I have another question as well. The, um, you know, your, your latest work um, that, that is that we, we t talked about a little bit this morning, um, and that is the use of MRI and being a little bit more deliberate in your MRI sequences. Um, and based on the article that is published right now, electronically at least, um, you know, the MRI sequence that you developed with the radiologist, decreased anesthesia duration, sequencing, um, contrast. I mean, there's so many benefits to really looking at that deliberate MRI. And you've developed a system right now within your own clinical practice. Um, is there, from a pediatrician or someone who works at another hospital system, is that now, is there now a published protocol that can be used for someone that doesn't have a specialty or perhaps a um, a clinical practice that just deals in musculoskeletal infections that you can implement within your hospital system or when you're trying to get an MRI on a child for suspicion of infection within the community? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a tricky uh, thing to ask for because the reality is MRIs are, uh, you have a very specific study you need to order. And it's not based on any degree of customization that you can do of that scan experience. So I can't order an extended field of view, uh, you know, looking at the correct body area and extending it the direction that makes the most sense. I have to order a pelvis or a femur or a knee or a tibia. You have to order it in a very specific way. And the decisions often need to be made in a vacuum, devoid of the conversation with the radiologist who's going to be executing the study. So that's the fragmented way in which it's done at large. And, if, and so I would say, uh, you know, a more ideal way is to wait on that scan. You know, I think some of it is used as a screening tool, as a shortcut. I see MRIs ordered quite commonly as, I don't know what you have, but I'm going to get an MRI and that's going to tell us what you have. And uh, while it does provide a lot of information, 
and it is a helpful study and a helpful tool, I think that it has to be used in the whole context of what we're trying to accomplish. And, and so that's what we've done institutionally, but it's not out there. You could read our paper and you could tell your radiologist, I want one of these, and they would be confused. They would be worried too. <laughs> they would be worried, I'm not gonna get all the sequences and all the cuts and all the, and with and without contrast that I've awakened this child who had anesthesia and, and I didn't give you everything you need. So that's what drives that, is everyone's worried about how their practice is gonna be perceived if they don't do it the, the old traditional way. But, but is it, that's all also a lot of, the billing has dictated that as well, right? Because, the, because they understand MRI of the knee, MRI of the femur, MRI of the hip, but they don't understand a musculoskeletal infection a screening MRI of the lower extremity. Yeah, that's uh, true. I, I, I don't think that the word billing ever has come up in all that process of, you know, now we do these scans, I, I do them as short as six minutes, and the, no one's ever concerned about how are we going to bill for this. Uh, it's like the patient is, you know, should be driving our, our perception, and I'm sure they do bill for it, and I'm sure they bill for their interpretation, and it's a, it's a scan that was done, so uh, it's just not done with and without contrast, so that changes their billing level, but it's tricky. I think that uh, just to try and take that out of the box and run with it, uh, it requires a commitment of someone to be involved at that point of care and to be there when the scan is being done and to be articulating the things, this is what I'm worried about or interested in, this is what I think we're going to see. I like to say uh, pre-MRI mental imaging. Uh, I tried to put, put that in the paper and they didn't understand what that meant. But in my mind, I've done the history, the physical exam, I've reviewed all the basic data, and in my mind, I can think, I know what this MRI is gonna look like. I have a pretty good feeling for it. And then the MRI has to prove the differences, and occasionally we get pleasantly surprised because we extended our field of view, we thought it was distal femur, and discovered it was proximal femur. And because of the pressure within the bone, they, they still had distal femoral tenderness, and had we only scanned the knee, we would have missed it. And so the, it's that, uh, why did I extend it proximally and not distally? Well, because I, I'm going within that segment of bone. And so that's a, that is a judgment process that I uh, utilize. And so uh, your results may vary You know, if you try and utilize this. I know that even within our practice with 12 orthopedic surgeons covering trauma and infection when I'm not around, it, it differs substantially. And now we're trying to grapple with that. How do you, how do you make a more of a community-based approach of a thought process that is very complex. And in my mind, I, I'm trying to distill this into principles that others could apply. With the, the other groups across, across the country, have you noticed the volume that you see here comparatively to what they're seeing? Is it pretty, are they pretty equivalent or? It varies regionally, and I, because I do think that these things are climate-based and it's based on uh, temperature trends. Even seasonally, we have variation. And so, uh, but there is a substantial amount. So Cortices did a tier one study at 18 centers, and they had over 7,800 musculoskeletal infection evaluations done at all those centers. Uh, we happen to be one of the largest of the evaluations. And then the culture positivity rate of those evaluations was, it was about 2,500 cases. So, the, you know, similar uh, concept, about uh, two out of every three ended up not being a culture positive identified infection. But that percentage differs substantially. We have one of the lowest rate of culture positive identifications because we have that broad net. We see all of these other things and we include that in our evaluations. And other centers, because the way the orthopedic surgeons practice, they're, they're basically telling the hospitalists, the infectious disease doctors, the emergency room doctors, call me when you know what it is, <laughs> when it's like cut here, you know, aspirate this. So they have, you know, rates as high as 80% culture positivity at some centers. So I, there's enough um, uh, volume nationwide at each of the centers to make it a very interesting uh, idea to study the, these conditions in a multi-center way that starts to get to a different uh, paradigm to, to maybe minimize the thought processes that are out there, like the simple algorithmic approaches and the, the, the Coker criteria. And so that's what we need to do next. Thanks. Thank you.